Hello, my name is Hayden Scott. I'm the lead instructor for EMS University of San Antonio. Uh, I'm also an active EMT intermediate or advanced level EMT. Uh, now we're going to go over uh, lesson 4.9, OB-GYN emergencies. To start, we're going to look at the three stages of labor. The first stage being effacement or dilation. This stage begins with the very first uterine contraction and ends with the complete dilation of the cervix. Then the second stage begins, which is the expulsion stage. This begins with the complete dilation of the cervix and ends when the infant is delivered. The final stage of, of labor is placental delivery. This begins as soon as the infant is born and ends as soon as the placenta has been delivered. As with any other procedure, uh, complications can arise uh, throughout the pregnancy and even during delivery. One of the biggest issues that arises with pregnancies are miscarriages. Um, it's when the body spontaneously aborts the fetus during any point of the pregnancy. Then you have seizures during a pregnancy. This is known as eclampsia. Uh, vaginal bleeding can occur. Uh, any kind of trauma could jeopardize the pregnancy. Uh, prolapsed cord. Breach delivery, where the baby is turned around. Uh, limb presentation. This can be very very detrimental during the delivery period. Meconium staining, as well as premature delivery. First we're going to look at the miscarriage. Like I said earlier, this is a spontaneous abortion. Uh, first thing you do, size up the scene, always. Is it safe for you to be there? Then you'll perform your initial assessment. This should be done as you walk in the door and lay eyes on the patient. Then you're going to get a detailed history and physical exam. It's vital that you get a baseline set of vitals, always, with any pregnant female. You always want that baseline vitals, simply because if anything is remotely off chart, from where it should be. This could cause very serious complications during the delivery, during um, any part of the spontaneous abortion. However, it is always, always important to treat the patient based on signs and symptoms. These women can withstand a lot. So it's important that you get the baseline vitals so that you know how to treat them. Apply external vaginal pads. Uh, you can also use abdominal pads, anything that's super absorbent. Um, the mother is going to be expelling quite a bit of blood and tissue. It's a very important that you put that barrier uh, there. Always make sure you bring all fetal tissue to the hospital. Uh, any tissue that's expelled by the mother needs to arrive at the hospital with the mother. And it's always important to remember to be supportive to the mother. Uh, if this is late term miscarriage, you can consider resuscitative efforts if applicable. Uh, usually about the only time uh, within the pregnancy that you'll be able to potentially resuscitate the uh, aborted fetus is usually about the 30 week mark. Um, it can be done sooner but this will completely depend um, on your protocols, your local protocols, um, as well as your advanced level partner. Uh, it is absolutely vital that you be completely supportive to the mother. Uh, this is a very trying time for her. Uh, so you have to be sure to be sympathetic, if not empathetic, 
uh, to what she's going through. This is going to be a very emotional time for her, as well as for him. Women can have a seizure during their pregnancy. This is known as eclampsia. First thing you do, as always, size up the scene. Is this something that you could potentially need an advanced life support trainer? Always be aware of your surroundings and be aware of um, any supportive um, staff that you could need. You'll perform your initial, initial assessment, a history and uh, physical exam, as always a baseline set of vitals. Again, your treatment is going to be based solely on the vitals and symptoms of the patient. Anytime a pregnant woman uh, is being transported, it's always safe to transport her on her left side. This takes pressure off of the uh, in inferior vena cava as well as the descending aorta. Uh, could potentially cause um, issues with their vital signs and their perfusion. Um, so it's always safe to transport on the left side, especially the, um, if your uh, patient has had an eclamptic seizure. Vaginal bleeding. Uh, any late pregnancy vaginal bleeding can present with or without pain. Each case is different. There's no textbook on this. There's not going to be a textbook case at all. Um, as with anything else, you're going to size up the scene. Is it safe? Your initial assessment. Do you need an ALS truck? Uh, how profuse is the bleeding? Is she using a lot of volume? Uh, would it be more beneficial to bring in an advanced life support truck if you were not already one? Uh, she may need uh, fluid replacement, uh, potentially cardiac care as well. You want to get a detailed history and physical exam. Baseline vitals cannot be stressed enough. You always have to get baseline vitals on any pregnant female. Again, treat the pati patient based on the signs and symptoms as well as the vitals. And apply external vaginal pads. Uh, again, if you don't have vaginal pads on board, use an abdominal pad. Uh, use a trauma dressing. Use something that's extra absorbent that's going to withstand a lot of fluid output. Trauma, in trauma cases, you want to care for the pregnant trauma patient uh, the same as you would any other patient. The problem is, and you always have to be mindful of, instead of just one patient, you have two patients. Which case, you kind of have to ask yourself which one is more important, the mother or the baby. Uh, the baby... Well, yes, it is living. The mother, it is understood, can always procreate more. So generally, we tend to stick with uh, resuscitation efforts on the mother uh, before the baby. What do you ask? Are you pregnant? It's always a good way to start. How long have you been pregnant? Try to get the date of conception. Nine times out of ten, the their uh, provider has been able to give them a da an estimated date of conception, um, as well as an estimated uh, delivery date um, or due date. Are there any contractions? Is there any pain? Uh, this could take your treatment one way or the other on two different ends of the spectrum. Is there any bleeding or discharge? You always want to pinpoint whether it's bleeding or whether it's discharge. If it's discharge, what kind is it discharge? What does it look like? Be specific. Um, one thing you can ask or assess on your own is there crowning occurring with the contractions? This is going to be obviously a telltale sign as to whether or not you're going to deliver a baby in your truck. 
What is the frequency and duration of the contractions? This is also going to be tell-tell as to how far along in the delivery path you are. Um, the hospital, when you call in your report, is going to want to know how frequent and how long the contractions are. That way they know what to prepare for. Does the mother feel as if she's having a bowel movement with increasing pressure in the vaginal area? This is one of the biggest, um, I guess, complaints, if you will, uh, immediately prior to delivery. Feel like they're having a bowel movement. It's getting, there's more and more pressure building up all in the vaginal area. Um, does she feel the need to push? If the answer is yes, you are about to deliver a baby. If it's no, then you might have a little bit of time. Is her abdomen rock hard? This is pretty indicative of contractions, um, and you're getting pretty close to the um, delivery of the child. What not to do? Never ever under any circumstances touch the vaginal areas except during delivery and when your partner is present. Uh, the reason for this is obvious. Um, we don't want any misconstrued um, gestures. Um, so only during delivery and only when your partner is present as a witness. Do not ever let the mother go to the bathroom. Um, there are a lot of reasons. Um, hemodynamic instability, as well as there, it's very possible that she could deliver in the bathroom. And what she feels is the need to go to the restroom could in fact be um, an indicator that she is about to deliver. Do not pull the mother's legs together. This could cause severe issues during the delivery of a child. It's always good to recognize your own limitations and transport, even if you must deliver en route to the hospital. Um, you're not a mobile neonatal intensive care unit on wheels. Uh, you have to know your own limitations, both as a medic, uh, but also as a unit. Um, so it's always good to be mindful about that. Do not flip out. If you flip out, the mother will then in turn flip out, and this could cause issues during the baby, uh, during the delivery. It could overstress the uh, mother, which could overstress the infant. Uh, so it's 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 always a good idea. Take a couple of deep breaths. Do not flip out. Yes, it is a very stressful time, but let your training take over. You know what to do. You know how to handle the situation. Just take a deep breath and remember back to what you were taught to do. Do not ever send your partner to boil some water. It is absolutely useless. For the delivery, you want to be sure to don gloves, a mask, gown, eye protection, all for infection control precautions. You are going to be dealing with blood born, uh, with bodily fluids. So you want to make sure that you are covered head to toe in PPE. You don't want to risk uh, coming in contact with any of the body fluids. On the flip side of this as well, you want to make sure that you're not introducing uh, any further bacteria into the um, vaginal region uh, during the delivery. Have the mother lie with knees drawn up and spread apart. Um, everybody's seen on TV. Have her draw her knees as close far to her chest as she can. You're probably going to have to help her hold. Put her foot uh, on one of the cabinets. Uh, on the opposite side of the rig. Hold the other foot with your hand if you can. Uh, she could even put her foot on your shoulder. It, everybody is different. Every situation is going to be different. 
but you want to have the knees drawn up and spread apart. Elevate the buttocks. Slide some pillows or some blankets underneath her uh, buttocks. Uh, this will help elevate uh, the area that you need to get to. Create a sterile field around the vaginal opening with sterile towels or paper barriers. Uh, this needs to be as close to sterile as possible, simply because this infant has been in a completely sterile environment for 10 months, uh, and any introduced bacteria could not only introduce infection to the uh, newborn, but also to the mother as well. Uh, and post-delivery infections uh, actually do run pretty rampant. So always be mindful of uh, a sterile, uh, of keeping as sterile a field as you can during the delivery. When the infant's head appears during crowning, place the fingers on the bony part of the skull, not the fontanelles or the face. The fontanelles are easy to see. They will either be just a little bulging or just a little um, flat, maybe even a little divoted. Don't put your fingers in the soft spot. Don't put it in the face either. This is very soft tissue. You have to be very, very careful. You could cause a lot of damage if you don't stay exactly on the bone. You'll want to exert gentle pressure to prevent expl an explosive delivery. Um, this is what some people call catching the football. You don't want a delivery like that. It could cause a lot of severe issues for both mother and infant. If the amniotic sac has not broken um, or doesn't break during the delivery, use a clamp to puncture the sac and push it away from the infant's head and mouth as they appear. Um, if the amniotic sac is intact and it is covering the nose and the mouth, um, this uh, could cause a suffocation or uh, an aspiration or a suffocation effect. So uh, always be mindful. Uh, if the sac hasn't ruptured, be sure to use a clamp um, to puncture the sac and then get the sac away from the head and mouth as soon as, you po as, soon as possible. As the infant's head is being born, you need to determine if the umbilical cord is around the neck. Slip it over the shoulder or clamp and cut and unwrap it, um, if it is around the neck. Uh, this could potentially strangle the infant, so you need to get the cord clear of the neck as soon as possible. Like I said, either slip it over the shoulder or clamp it, cut it, and unwrap it from the neck. After the head is born, you need to support it. Suction the mouth two or three times and the nostril. Uh, in each OB kit, you'll more than likely have a bulb syringe. This is the most suction that you will need. Um, be sure to completely compress the bulb syringe before you insert it into the mouth and nose. You always want to um, suction the mouth first. One, because it is the largest orifice. And the first thing infants do is inhale and scream. However, you want to use conscious er, you want to use caution to avoid contact with the back of the mouth. Their hard palate isn't formed yet. You could severely damage the tissue. Um, and that's the last thing you need to be worrying about. So always use a uh, very gentle technique when suctioning um, out the infant's mouth and nostrils. As the torso and full body are born, support the infant with both hands. Keep in mind, babies are very slippery. They are covered in amniotic fluid, as well as other fluids. So be very, very, very careful and do not let the infant slip out of your hands at all. Um, so it, be very, very mindful of how you're holding the infant. Be sure you're supporting the head and the neck, um, as well as the rest of the body so that it doesn't slip right out of your hands. As the feet are born, grasp the feet. Uh, you want to wipe blood and mucus from the mouth and nose with a sterile gauze. Remember, you need to keep this as sterile as possible. Suction the mouth and the nose again. 
using the bulb syringe. Now you want to wrap the infant in a warm blanket and place it on its side, head slightly lower than the uh, rest of the body. This is to promote blood flow um, to the brain and other vital organs. However, you want to keep the infant level with the vagina until the cord is cut. If you, by chance, cut the cord because it was uh, around the baby's neck, then that's fine. But until the cord has been clamped and cut, you need to keep the infant level with the vagina. The baby at this point is still attached to the placenta, still attached to mom. Um, so you don't want to put it any lower because uh, that could cause a, um, a rushing effect. Assign your partner to monitor the infant and complete the initial care of the newborn. Then you're going to place a clamp or tie on the umbilical cord 8 to 10 inches away from the baby. Then you're going to place a second clamp or tie approximately 4 fingers from the baby. After the pulsations on this section cease, then you can cut between the clamps or the ties. That means that no more blood flow is going through the umbilical cord and it is safe to cut. Um, but remember, do not make any incision or cut on the umbilical cord until after the pulsations cease. Now you're going to observe the vagina uh, for delivery of the placenta while preparing the mother and infant for transport, if they are not already in transport. As the placenta is delivered, wrap the placenta in a towel and place it in a plastic bag. It needs to be transported with the mother to the hospital. Once all of this is completed, you're going to place sterile pads over the opening of the vagina, lower the mother's legs, and help her hold them together. This is the only time it is safe for a mother to hold her legs together. Uh, this is going to help uh, ease some of the bleeding. Record the time of delivery and what county you are in. Both must be documented in the PCR. All of this stuff is going to be on the birth certificate. So it is vital to document exactly what time and what county that this child was delivered in. Vaginal bleeding. Um, a 500 cc blood loss after the delivery is well tolerated by the mother. And frankly, it's to be expected. Do not flip out. Pregnant women, expecting mothers, have up to 33% more blood volume than normal obvious reasons. They have been supporting a second life for you. A nursing newborn will assist with bleeding control in a pregnant patient who has just delivered. However, if there is excessive bleeding, massage the uterus. Hand with fingers fully extended, place on the lower abdomen just above the pubis. Massage over the area. If it continues, check technique, provide oxygen, and rapid transport. If you have an advanced level partner on board, it would be wise at this point to uh, potentially have them take over patient care. Your care of the newborn uh, initially will consist of drying and warming. Remember, cover the head. The head is a very large surface area for the infant, so it's going to lose a lot of its body heat through so you have to be sure to keep it covered. Um, you're going to position it uh, properly, either level with the uh, vagina or um, in a somewhat trendelum birth position. Suction it, suction it, suction it. However, remember, never use more than your bulb syringe. You're also going to stimulate it. Um, as you, this is a part of the warming process, actually. Once you wrap it up in the blanket, um, rub the cord, rub the legs, get the blood circulating. This is going to stimulate um, more of the cry, more of the movement. This is going to get the baby angrier, which is what you want. 
now we're going to review the APGAR scale. Uh, this scale is done at 1 minute and 5 minutes post-delivery. You're going to be checking the appearance. Uh, how does the baby look? Uh, what color are they? Their pulse. Their grimace, which is their facial expression. Um, are they crying? Are they just kind of whimpering? Are they not doing anything? Activity, are they moving around? Are their arms and legs fully flexing and extending? Um, are they working properly? properly? Uh, and respiratory, how is their respiratory rate? Are they really struggling or are they getting good deep breaths? Here is the APGAR scale. Um, each category uh, cannot get more than two points. Um, as you can see, the zero points for um, all of these, you know, absent heart rate, absent respiratory effort, absent muscle tone, completely flaccid. This child is just limp. Um, no response to irritation, and they are a pale blue color. Your one point scale, your heart rate is going to be less than 100. They're going to have slow and regular breaths. Um, you're going to see some flexion in the muscle tone. They are somewhat irritable um, and they're kind of a mix of blue and pink. Your two point uh, markers are going to be a heart rate over 100, a good strong cry, uh, active motion, uh, they're kicking, flailing, um, vigorous cry, highly irritable, and completely pink. Um, you could have two or three of these in the two point markers and one in the zero points, or one in the one, you know. It, it, this scale, um, your scores are gonna be all over the place. Uh, it's good to remember that not always will you get a, um, a 10 score on your patients. A lot of times, especially f newborns, will only on average have a seven or an eight. Um, and at their five minute mark, you know, some are just fine with a nine apno. Uh, of course, 10 is best, um, it's 100%, but, um, you know, it's not absolutely um, vital uh, to s uh, sustaining life. Now, in the event that you have to resuscitate the infant, um, their breathing effort will be shallow, slow, or absent. You have to provide artificial ventilations um, with infants. Respiratory drive is everything. If their breathing is um, ineffective, y they're going to um, crash on you very quickly. So the better you keep up their respiratory uh, effort, the less likely you are to have issues with um, cardiac or other issues. If the heart rate is less than 100 beats, provide artificial ventilation. Again, we go back to just about any resuscitation that you any issues can be fixed usually with artificial respirations. If their heart rate is less than 80 beats and they're not responding to ventilations, begin chest compressions. Um, remember two fingers just below the upper neck. If their heart rate is less than 60, no questions asked, you just begin chest compressions um, as well as artificial ventilations. Their color if they have central cyanosis, which means their core is blue, um, and they have spontaneous breathing and an adequate heart rate, administer free flow oxygen, 10 to 15 liters, using an oxygen tube and held as close to the newborn's face as possible. If they're not going to like it, they're going to fight it, they're going to turn away. You do everything they can to get away from it. Hold it as close as you can or as possible without any overly yelling, you know, obviously. 
Uh, one of the issues we discussed earlier is a prolapsed cord. This is a condition where the cord presents through the birth canal before the delivery of the head. This, of course, presents a serious medical emergency because it endangers the life of the unborn fetus. Um, care for a prolapsed cord is, uh, of course, the standard initial assessment, vital signs, and physical exam. Now, you want to position the head with the, uh, the mother with the head down and the buttocks uh, raised using gravity to lessen the pressure on the birth canal. Essentially, you want to put mom in travail in birth position. Um, this will take this will uh, bring the baby up off the uh, birth canal and release some of the pressure on the, on the uh, umbilical cord. Okay. Use a uh, sterile gloved hand, key word being sterile, into the vagina, pushing the presenting part of the fetus away from the pulsating fluid. Um, to rapidly transport this patient. Keep pressure on the presenting part, monitoring pulsations in the cord, and keep the cord moist and warm. Uh, you don't want to let it cool off or anything like that. You've got to keep in mind there is blood flowing through this umbilical cord between the mother and the child. And if anything happens to it, one or both of them have serious demise very quickly. Um, a breech birth position is um, a presentation that occurs when the buttocks or the lower extremity are low in the universe uterus and will be first part of the fetus delivery. Um, obviously this is a great risk for trauma as well as prolapse cord. Uh, as you can see the different variations of the breech presentation, you have the complete breech where just the buttocks is presenting, you have the incomplete breech where one leg is up in the birth canal. This is a very big issue right here. Um, and then you have the frank breech where both uh, feet are up further into the uterus um, and the placenta. Uh, this, um, all three of these are very, very critical. Uh, however, the frank breach is probably the more severe. Um, to manage this, you want to place the mother, again, in a head down position with the pelvis elevated and transport rapidly. Um, Place an arm under the infant, supporting its body, and place a sterile gloved hand into the vagina using fingers to provide an airway for the infant's lodged head. Uh, of course, you always want to do this as according to your protocols. So if your protocols state that uh, an advanced level provider needs to be doing this uh, intervention, um, then you need to get advanced uh, life support on scene. Limb presentation occurs when a limb of the infant protrudes from the birth canal. Now, the limb that presents is usually a foot. However, hands do present sometimes. For limb presentation, all you can do is transport rapidly with the mother in a head down, pelvis elevated position. Uh, this will take uh, the pressure off of the infant uh, in the birth canal. In the event of multiple births, you always need to call for additional resources. You cannot, as a unit, transport more than one, one mother with one baby. Um, with multiple births, you also have to be prepared for more due to resuscitation. Um, chances are these babies are going to be small. You've got to be prepared to resuscitate each and every one of them. Um, one way to tell, kind of a giveaway, if the mother's going to have multiple births, is if the mother does, if the mother's belly doesn't decrease proportionately with the size of the baby that was just born, you can expect another one to come out here pretty quick. 
Uh, it'll usually be a couple minutes after the first birth, but they can be right on top of each other. So it's always important to be aware. If you've just delivered an infant and mom's stomach size didn't decrease much at all, uh, chances are you should be ready to catch another baby. Now, meconium staining is a very large issue during the delivery of an infant. Meconium staining is amniotic fluid that is greenish or brownish or yellow rather than clear. This usually occurs uh, when the infant defecates um, into the amniotic sac, uh, usually caused by fetal distress um, during birth. If you notice meconium staining in the amniotic fluid, it is important to not stimulate the infant prior to suction with any fluids. If they aspirate any of the infant milk, they could end up with a very serious uh, leukemia or infection, and it could very well jeopardize their life. Uh, so if you notice any meconium staining, be sure you suction immediately suction with warm water before any stimulation is given to this infant. Premature deliveries are always at risk for hypothermia. They're a lot smaller, their bodies have not developed quite properly yet, um, so it makes it more difficult for them to regulate their own body temperature. Um, premature deliveries also usually require resuscitation. Um, so if you can absolutely avoid a premature delivery, do everything physically possible to try to help them in the field. These are very difficult deliveries, and the resuscitations are even more difficult. So if you can do anything to prevent this delivery from happening in the field, you need to do it. For vaginal bleeding, you want to remember BSI, proper BSI, even if it includes a gown for excessive vaginal bleeding. Uh, of course, maintain the airway, do your normal BLS, uh, oxygen, comfort, uh, be sure of course you get a very detailed history and physical exam, as well as an accurate set of baseline vitals. Um, you want to consider uterine massage after the delivery of the placenta. Uh, this will help the uterus to contract and the birth tract to pump blood, as well as to thaw off. Uh, if bleeding is excessive, however, and the patient is uh, hypovolemic or you're concerned about them become hyper becoming hypovolemic, um, bef and this is all before the placenta delivery, remember to get an, a higher patch level to get an advanced patch level um, just because this mother is going to be more than just uh, oxygen and palliative care. Uh, they're going to need an IV, uh, potentially a cardiac monitor and such. Um, for trauma emergencies, uh, you want to treat any trauma to the external genitalia as any other soft tissue in the womb. Never, ever pack Never stick anything up your nose. Um, just I if there's vaginal uh, trauma or bleeding, just place a pad over it. Do not ever pack anything into the vagina. Sexual assault or criminal assault situations require initial and ongoing assessment, management, and psychological care. It's always important to remember your BSI, your airway. You have to keep a non-judgmental attitude during your sample focus assessment. You have to keep a non-judgmental attitude, period. Um, the woman's going to be very vulnerable. She's going to be very upset. Um, she's going to potentially be very unstable psychologically. 
system, you have to be sure to have a supporting attitude. Uh, a very supportive attitude. Very sympathetic. Very empathetic. Um, just reassuring you that, you know, we're going to take good care of you and we're doing everything that we can. However, you have to remember to maintain that lifestyle. Uh, sexual assault in a woman's body is part of a lifestyle. So, do not do anything um, above her cis uh, beyond her cis measures um, without notifying the police department. Do everything that you can to maintain the integrity of the lifestyle. Uh, you want to examine external genitalia only if the police believe it's present. If you don't notice any cookies floating, there's no reason for you to be examining it. Uh, leave that for the sexual assault nurse. Um, of course, just encourage the patient to bathe and avoid or clean the areas. Just kind of destroy the evidence. Uh, document very thoroughly. And, of course, always report to remember the main facts. If you have any questions, please uh, direct them to the Instructor of Record. Uh, have a nice evening.